everybody, so welcome to the Environmental Evolution Genetics Lab, the first lab of the, the module. And this lab will actually link into your lectures that you've been doing in terms of embryonic development and new development in particular, and Hox genes. So the lab itself will hopefully allow you to do what you've been doing the past three years in your undergraduate, which is just some basic semi quantitative QPCR, but in this context, using two specific genes. One Hox CLA acting as a housekeeping gene. Remember to look at the pre lab seminar I've also added before you go into this uh, actual recording uh, and uh, have a look at that to give you the some background information regarding the lab itself. So I've pre recorded this uh, lecture uh, and uh, the lab itself in this session. So try to have a go at those learning experiences, learning tasks that we have put in there now and anyway. Definitely have a look at that. And also I've added some additional tools which will help you understand uh, the principles of semi quantitative PCR if you didn't know them well before. So let's get started and let's just jump into the actual lab itself. So this is the PCR Master Mix uh, table that you need to be familiar with in terms of what samples, uh, what cDNA, what genes and what tube numbers that you need to go into. Remember you need to add 25 microliters of your Master Mix into each tube and the corresponding primers and the lastly is the most sensitive and most important thing is your cDNA. As you can see from the technician, the first thing you do is you have all your samples ready in the ice bucket and then add the highest volume, which is the mango master mix, which is going to contain all the important ingredients for your PCR to work, such as the magnesium chloride, uh, the DNTPs, uh, and the kind of buffers to maintain optimal PCR. The next step is to actually, once you set up your PCR reaction, is to add all your uh, samples to uh, the thermocycler and this table here is just showing you exactly what setup and what conditions we need to do uh, and just be aware that uh, A to H are referring to different temperatures we tested just to see optimize the best primer for amplification. So as you can see the technician is actually adding now the samples to the to the thermocycler and of course uh, she needs to actually add the samples, don't forget to do that of course uh, but what they've done is they've set up the machine so the conditions are ready to go and all you need to do is add the samples to the machine. So add the samples to the machine and it doesn't really matter what order you put them in and just make sure you check the lids actually and make sure they've been, they're tight so that any kind of uh, heat it doesn't evaporate the samples which will affect your uh, PC amplification and lastly the machine allows you to adjust the volume so we've got like a 50 microliter to 25 microliter reaction volume and you can set that and press OK to make a negarose gel first you need to set up your apparatus start by taping the ends of the gel casting tray with autoclave tape Make sure there is a good seal between the tape and the edges of the tray to avoid leaks. You will most likely not be able to make your own gel. This is just to demonstrate what actually happens before you arrive in the lab itself. Lay the gel casting tray on the bench and insert the gel comb. There are two different types of combs that will make different size wells to run your samples. Make sure you choose the size that fits your needs. You should place your comb at the top end of the casting tray or if you would like two sets of wells on the gel you can place a second comb in the middle of the tray. Next you need to prepare your agarose. First measure out the required volume of 1 times TAE buffer. For this small casting tray you need 50 mils. Pour this into a 250 mil flask. Now you need to weigh out your agarose powder. This should be done in the weigh safe to prevent inhalation of the powder. Turn the weigh safe on at the side of the box, then turn on the balance and wait for it to calibrate. Once calibrated, place a weigh boat on top of the pan and zero the balance. Weigh out the appropriate amount of agarose. For most experiments, you will want to make a 1% agarose gel. Therefore here, you will weigh out 0.5 grams of agarose to add to your 50 mils of buffer.
Once you have weighed out the agarose, remove it from the balance and clean your spatula and the balance with blue roll and biocleanse solution. Make sure you turn off all of the equipment as soon as you have finished with it. Now carefully pour the agarose powder into the flask with the buffer and gently swirl to mix. To melt the agarose you will use a microwave. Set the microwave to run for 1 minute but check the flask after 20 seconds and then more frequently as the agarose heats up and begins to melt. Never leave the agarose unattended in the microwave and do not allow this solution to boil vigorously. Make sure you have a heat resistant glove as the flask will get hot. To check whether the agarose is melted, remove the flask from the microwave and gently swirl it to look for particles in the buffer. When the agarose has melted sufficiently, you will see a clear solution with just a few grains floating in it. Here you can see the solution is still cloudy and therefore not fully melted. Here you can see the solution is now clear and fully melted. Carefully take the melted agarose back to your bench. Now you need to add CyberSafe so that you are able to visualise your DNA after running your gel. CyberSafe is supplied as a 10,000 times solution, so in this case we would add 5 microliters of CyberSafe to the agarose solution. Once the CyberSafe is added, gently swirl the flask to evenly distribute it within the melted gel, then carefully pour the gel into the casting stand and check for any leaks. If there are no leaks, then leave the agarose on the bench to set. You will know when the gel is set because it will become cloudy. Once the gel is set, carefully remove the autoclave tape and place the casting tray inside the gel tank. Carefully and slowly remove the comb, making sure that you lift the comb straight up to avoid damaging the wells. Now add a few hundred mils of 1 times TAE buffer to a jug and carefully pour this into the gel tank. Fill the two reservoirs at either end of the tank and then finally add a small amount of buffer over the gel to the fill line on the side of the tank. Next, add your samples to the wells in the agarose gel. Carefully pipette the samples by hovering your tip at the top of the well and gently depressing the pipette. Try not to touch the agarose gel with your pipette tip as you may break it. If you have shaky hands, it is often helpful to use your other hand to steady your pipetting hand, as shown here. Once you have loaded your samples onto the gel, you should fit the lid firmly on top of the tank, making sure that you are connecting the red side of the lid to the red side of the base. Then insert the cables into the power pack, again connecting the red connector to the red socket and the black connector to the black socket. Set the voltage to the required number, often this is 100 volts, and press run on the power pack. You should see bubbles emerge from the wire on the black side of the tank. Your DNA will run from the black side of the tank to the red side of the tank. So always check that your samples are loaded near the black end of the gel tank. Just to show you what the gel would look like as it would run. This is a still image, but just to show you that uh, the loading dye that you include in your gel will allow you to visualize all the time uh, the migration of your samples. So this should give you an idea of how far the samples are run and you want to just make sure that they run uh, approximately three quarters of the way of the gel to give you better resolution. And again this goes back to the product size we would expect uh, and again this links to the uh, worksheet that I've uh, included as well. Uh, so have a look at that at the end and uh, just make sure that you're aware that this separation is important and the longer the better uh, over time. 
So this is the table that you've loaded your gels with. So samples one to five, lanes one to five, lanes uh, top and bottom lanes, and each lane has, has been clearly described and what samples it is, what product size we expect to see based on the primers we've designed. So once the PC has finished, we visualize the gel uh, using a gel dock. If you remember what I mentioned earlier in the video that as you come into the lab, the gels are already made, but they contain a very specialized chemical or a component known as CyberSafe. CyberSafe allows the, which basically binds to double-stranded DNA, so this is your PCI product, and it integrates and binds, and when it's excited by UV, which is gel dock system will do now, uh, and we will demonstrate it later with an image, is that when it's excited by UV, it actually expresses, or you can detect it uh, under this gel dock system. So again, just to give you an overview, so CyberSafe is added to the gel, which binds to the double strand DNA, and when it's excited through UV, it leads to the detection and visualization of the bands, and then we can do the analysis of our bands within that. So let's look at the results. So the results are really important to give you an idea of what's going on. So as you can see from the gel that we see that Hox C11 uh, during embryogenesis is activated an increase in expression of embryo development days E10 to E17. And we can see that from the intensity of bonds increase around about the two to 300 base pairs. And our actin is really important because that gives us an idea of what, uh, how accurate our experiments are. So our loading control actin, which should be uh, consistent and the same expressed all the way through our experiment. So it gives us a, uh, equal loading uh, analysis. So the TOXI11 is dynamically changing expression as we go through embryo stages required for limb development. And this is the simplest way to look at it in terms of expression. So we know what size we should be expecting to see, which is around about, uh, if I remember correctly, for the HOX uh, samples, we were hoping to see around about 200 uh, base pairs, uh, while 221 base pairs, uh, while for the actin. So if we look at the gel samples, we can see the banding is actually exactly where it should be, and the intensity of the band dictates expression. Remember, the length uh, doesn't really uh, represent anything, but the thickness and intensity excitations you can see quite nicely for Hox 3C11. So I've added a few extra components uh, in our in the, in the worksheet. So have a go at that. And remember, this is an assess, but it's really important that you apply this knowledge to your skills in the future and uh, it will be important for your master's or PhD programs of future careers you decide to do. So thank you again for very much for watching and listening and taking part. Take part in the tasks that I've set to you uh, and uh, I'm hoping to integrate into this video, if not, at least part of the now learning. So thank you for listening and again, uh, have another look at the tasks and assessments uh, and I will direct you to these. And take care.